It's 2.47 a.m. in the Southern Reach, and you're listening to Night Call. Hi, I'm Tess Lynch in Los Angeles, and with me are... I'm Molly Lambert. And in New York, I'm Emily Yoshida. Welcome back to Night Call, you guys. Um, We have a very exciting podcast for you today, but we are going to kick off with the most important topic, which is... Kim Kardashian. Always. Otaku. (laughs) Kim Kardashian otaku. (laughs) Notice me, senpai. Uh, Kim Kardashian has been doing a lot of Instagram posting recently uh, since having her baby Chicago. And uh, people have been noticing that they're sort of increasingly thirst trappy with what she's been doing, where it's just like something more crazy each time or more trying to get attention-y. People are uh, surmising that she feels insecure about Kylie surpassing her as the number one Kardashian and now also the number one Kardashian mom. So, well, actually, there's only one number one Kardashian mom and you know it's Chris. <laughs> the OG. She's not a Kardashian. <laughs> it's true, but let's be real. She's the ultimate. She's the queen. I thought you were going to say Courtney. <laughs> no, but I I do love Courtney. I was most. like, Courtney's the only one who seems like maybe chill and a good yeah. mom. And Secretly good. chill. I feel a little disconnected from things because I can't understand how anybody, especially somebody within her own family, would find Kylie's circumstances and motherhood right now to be in any way enviable. <laughs> but um, that's just sexy. me. <laughs> It's sexy to have a baby when you're a billionaire. Isn't it? Billionaire babies. They're just boss babies. Baby. <laughs> just to prove you can do it. Like, exactly. I mean, you know, I'm trying to be open-minded, but she did put a Snapchat filter on the first picture of the baby, and I was like, this baby is doomed. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you say that about all the babies at various points? Like, didn't we probably say that about Kendall and Kylie in, like, the first season of Keeping I Up mean, with the Kardashians? I mean, again, like, now I'm like, that's so, like, they didn't have a Snapchat filter on their infant photos that really made me go huh yeah we're in a, di- a new world now <laughs> yeah um i saw a story the other day that was about people bringing in snapchat filter selfies to plastic surgeons it's apparently Ooh. really common now Jesus. and they come out with roses growing on their foreheads yeah and sparkles and spangles on and their weird, eyes like dilated pupils yeah yeah, yeah. they're like i want to look like i look <laughs> make me look like this deer filter i want to be a deer um, so Kim Kardashian posted on her Instagram. She now has pink hair. That's her new her new uh, Instagram stunt is that she got pink hair. And she posted a picture of an anime babe with pink hair and said, this was my inspiration. Yep. And uh, Emily, I'll defer to you as the expert um, anime podcaster. Yeah. What do you think it means? What do I think it means? Well, I mean, I think we discussed this maybe on a group chat that... Obviously, well, I mean, I, I won't rule out the fact that, that Kim uh, enjoys herself some anime on her own, but I feel like definitely Kanye has made her watch Akira at some point. That has <laughs> definitely happened at some point in their relationship. Um, and where she chose to go with her fandom and interest in the medium from there is, uh, you know, anyone's guess. But I do think that right now there is, I would be more shocked about Kim embracing on may or even taking style cues from anime at any other time but right now i feel like it is uh there's a wave right now of celebrities coming out of their otaku closets but aren't you glad about it because at least it's like reclaiming it back from the alt-right who we were concerned had sort of taken over anime avatars yes and- they take yeah they try to take over everything but they're not taking anime yes i mean i am I am 100% for that. I'm 100% for Michael B. Jordan um, talking about Naruto um, in an interview. I mean, it's 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 very it's very endearing. Uh, or are you such a snob that you're like it devalues my Naruto fandom now that all the I don't new- give a fuck about Naruto. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he can have it, but it's it's still very sweet. Like, and I I've I like to ima- like just I mean it could be Fraser. You know, I like to imagine beautiful celebrities at home watching netflix watching you know 
uh, Pokemon or whatever in their free time. That's very, that makes me feel like I, you know, they're one of us. You have a generous spirit. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, I, yeah, I, it's hard for me to be snobby about anime because I'm like, you know, I've, I've explained this. I used to explain this on the podcast that I used to have, but I'm not like a, like, expert by any means. I don't know what that character is that Kim posted, and I didn't look it up actually in time for this podcast, which I probably should have done. But, uh, you know, it's it's cool. Like, I <laughs> I don't know. I'm not mad at it. Uh, and I feel like it's just a outgrowth of the fact that all these shows are so much easier to watch now than they were like when we were when we were teens. Back or, in the day. Yeah. So, you know, it's accessible and it just can like, you know, absorb itself into the culture a little more easily than it could have a while ago. Which is fine and cool. I like it. Well, last week we talked about Phantom Thread, but not in time for the podcast. Molly got um, a text from her friend illuminating a theory that we all thought was really interesting. So we wanted to just jump back so that we could kind of explore this theory. So uh, Phantom Thread theory time. Um, Friend of the podcast, uh, Gil Keenan, who is also a director from the San Fernando Valley um, told me that he had a Phantom Thread theory. He would let me in on after I saw the movie. So when I asked him what it was, he, I will read it. He texted it to me. He said, oh, just that Alma is a camp survivor. Her parents were killed there. She made it to England after the war, and the recent memory of the loss is what makes her so strangely numb, but also equipped to handle Woodcock and his Gestapo sister. Also, she becomes weirdly animated by the disrespect that the old rich lady shows to the dress after the press conference scene where the fi- press asks the fiancé about his family's involvement in a scandal involving Jewish visas. Ooh. Hmm. And I wrote back, oh, it's the night porter. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my answer to everything. It, it was interesting to kind of, I think Molly dived deep, as did I, into the uh, into finding ways to justify this theory. But um, I'll, I'll let Molly go first. And Emily, I, I bet you have your own thoughts. But it was it was thought provoking because that the Jewish visas thing really stood out in the movie as being like very specific information that was kind of dropped and then not really revisited. So it, I think it stuck out to all of us as being kind of strange. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, also if Paul Thomas Anderson wants to call us and be like, you know nothing of my work, like, yeah. please, <laughs> we just give us a night like, call. Yeah, we like to uh, theorize, but uh, you know, I I'm also willing to accept that this might not be true at all. But um, Emily, what did you think? Um, well, I mean, I, I I really like the theory. I think I think it would explain. I think it would explain her resistance to uh, Reynolds and Cyril. If she was forced into this situation, like if she was hired as a maid or something like that. But she's, you know, she's drawn to it herself. It's not just a resisting of a thing. It's like she's actually attracted to their <laughs> their Gestapo ways. Well, that's uh, where the night porter comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I feel like, I don't know. I would, I would need a little more um, psychological uh, back up there as, as far she as that She said she could stand forever. Yeah. Because <laughs> she, she has the resilience. Well, Tess oh my God. did, as the Robert Graysmith, Tess <laughs> did a lot of real research and came back with like much information that well, supports this theory. I don't know if it supports the theory, but there's there's some interest. I kind of went down a rabbit hole and found like some weird some weird threads, if you will. <laughs> so one thing that I found um, that was interesting from Nylon, it doesn't address the... Uh, you know, the Holocaust in particular, but it, it is interesting vis-a-vis that scene. So it, it the article says, one of Woodcock's most important clients is the heiress Barbara Rose. Anderson gives Harris only four scenes in the Phantom Thread, and they're not long in terms of length, but it seems that Barbara Rose is like a message stitched into the fabric of the narrative, and her appearance feels crucial to understanding the rather obscure meanings of the movie. Oh, yes, it does. So... <laughs> Basically, though her first name is Barbara, you know, uh, it didn't occur to me that Harris was playing a role based on the Woolworth heiress Barbara Hutton until her second scene. This is all quoted from Nylon, by the way, where Anderson stages Barbara Rose's humiliating press conference announcing her marriage to a noted playboy who is clearly meant to be the infamous Porfirio Ruberosa. So then there was a Vanity Fair profile on Ruberosa. It says um, that he was unable to return to his country because he was basically, you know, 
he would, he had been selling Dominican visas to Jews wishing to flee Europe and had been kind of found out. And Barbara Hutton was the poor little rich girl that was, you know, poor, every poor little rich girl movie and book has been based on. Um, so she was kind of like a sad sack. She, I think she got married six times or something. And, uh, at one point was married to Cary Grant. Like she was a really kind of bizarre and like sad person who squandered her fortune yeah this is the thing i was talking about last week but i couldn't remember the names of them so yeah there's a lot of further reading on uh barbara hutton and porfirio um on the internet to be found i think several people i think uh there's a piece on vanity fair about it as well yes that was there was a vanity there's a nylon piece in the vanity fair piece about barbara hutton too I also found some interesting things about um, people who were sewing me- secret messages into needlework uh, while they were in Nazi camps. Um, there was a guy named Alexis Castali, and he was he would add secret messages to the stuff that he was sewing um, in Morse code around you know some piece of needlework. He wrote "fuck Hitler," and then there was also. Um, the case there were like all of these women who were working under Hedwig Hoes, um, who was the wife of a concentration camp commander. And she had a dressmaking workshop where they would do haute couture, um, and kind of like make these gowns for, for, you know, Nazi events. Um, and there was a book about it that I guess then was adapted into a young adult novel by a woman named Lucy Adlington. But it said that, um, there's a, I pulled a quote from an article in the uh, Express about this, but it says the clients even came to the concentration camp wor- uh, camp workshops for fittings and consultations, all part of what Adlington calls the repulsive mock civilization of the Nazi regime. One of the Auschwitz seamstresses, a Slovakian dressmaker named Lulu Gruenberg, could barely control her resentment at the indifference and arrogance of the women for whom she was making clothes to survive. Wow. Hey, that's just super interesting. I went yeah. way down the hole on this. That also sounds like a to- like that does sound like a- made for a novel. Also, I believe that there is a novel based on that. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'm also like make a movie about that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Somewhere in the article, they said they were sewing for their lives, like they were trying to prove their talent and like you know worth to be kept around. And- All the Nazi things where they made people like do creative stuff to like prove that they should survive, like the yeah. musicians. Mm-hmm. You know, it's fucking that's the scariest. It thing. is the scariest. Thing. I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, I do know why. It's strange that all of, I mean, it's it's interesting that you can kind of find these weird, you know, articles that, that seem to relate to the phantoms. I mean, it's definitely about a certain time and then you get into like the seamstresses and the hidden messages being sewed into things. But it's it, it was interesting, the, the passports or the visa line being like this weird clue and yeah. you think you're going to follow it and find something concrete, but you, but it is a phantom thread. <laughs> <laughs> it's merely a phantom thread. So let's take a night call. And as always, if you want to leave us a night call, you can give us a call at one two four zero four six night. That's one two four zero four six night. Or you can email us at nightcallpodcast at gmail.com. Which other, whichever method you prefer is A-OK with us and just leave us your questions, theories, comments, just your thoughts and we will uh, we'll address them on air. So we have a call today about a little movie that I think we've all seen. Let's see. Hey, this is Charlie in Texas. It is 12.05 a.m. True night call hours. Uh, I just got out of a screening of Annihilation, which fucking ruled. Everyone should go see it. Um, but I noticed this is like the third time in a row where I've seen a movie and Jennifer Jason Lee randomly popped up and it made the movie a lot better. So I was wondering if there's any actors or actresses that you guys see randomly pop up in movies that you know will bring a good time. All right, thanks. So I really appreciate Charlie's PSA to go see Annihilation, a movie that I quite like. Spoiler alert. But um, I fear that it might be uh, a little too late for it, seeing as I think it's like maybe still in five theaters in the United States by the time you're hearing this podcast. Um, But yes, Jennifer Jason Leigh is in it. She's very scary and weird in it. And... uh, 
I'm a, I'm a fan of Jennifer Jason Lee. I, I, I feel Who like she isn't. I feel like she rarely pops up though. I'm usually very aware that Jennifer Jason Lee is going to be a movie before I see it. I had a spooky experience because I had no idea she was in this movie, oh. and my mind was wandering, and I was for some reason thinking about like. Hey, it's so weird that Noah Baumbach was married to Jennifer Jason Lee <laughs> and is now dates Greta Gerwig. And then, like, as I was thinking it, it was like then she appeared you on screen. You willed her to appear I on screen. I willed her. And I, like, was so weirded out because I was like, I'm, I don't normally just think about Jennifer Jason Lee. But oh, I don't was, lie. I, I was you. also, I was so happy to see her. Um, and she really brought me back into the movie she was I fantastic think. in that but wait what ca- what actors are you guys always happy to see um Luis guzman oh no, of course oh yeah. yeah that's a great one um i i kept trying to think of people and i just ended up coming back to everybody in the paddington movies um <laughs> jim broadbent is a big one for me um i love a jim broadbent cameo slash appearance uh you know who used to be one for me or like i mean he is no longer with us r.i.p but um when he appears in kind of a, if I'm watching an oldie or some, you know, kind of B-list thing I've never seen before, if Pete Postlethwaite shows up in something, I'm always really into that. Oh, yeah. Well, that also leads us into this this Danny Boyle yes. uh, conversation. Can I, can I say mine? Yes. Because I have two. Sorry, Danny Boyle affiliated. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mine are Martin Mull. Because he was Ooh. in an episode of Taxi, and yeah. he was also in an episode of The Golden Girls, and like I remember both of them. And then I was I was looking, I was like, oh, you know, what's his Wikipedia? And it's just like full of those things. And then also Richard Mazur. Have which, you ever seen Fernwood Tonight? No, that is the best show in the world, <laughs> uh, and kind of what I want Night Call to be like. What it's is like a Fernwood spinoff Tonight? of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Oh yeah. Um, that's all I'll say. Okay. Fernwood tonight. That's what Night Calls very Fernwood tonight inspired. Let's talk Annihilation. Let's though. talk we about all Annihilation. It. I wish Martin Mull had been in Annihilation. I do. He should have. Maybe he was. Maybe he was uh, the um, double. Emily, I'm going to break your heart right now. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> Tess and I did not love Annihilation we as much not. as you did, I think. Well, I you Tess, know. Tess actively disliked it. I was m- more more kind i think i liked a lot of things about it and i thought about it a lot afterwards yeah, me too. um we also saw it at 11 in the morning <laughs> that's the best time to see any movie i'm a huge fan of watching movies in the morning your mind is open you're not all tired and jaded yet so you know i feel like this was more of a night call movie a movie you might <laughs> want to watch at night well yeah <laughs> i mean for sure Spoiler alert about the the swirling guts in, scene in this movie. Is that was the at best. Eleven twenty in the morning, but it in a way it made us appreciate it more. I think because <laughs> our guts were still swirling with breakfast, and then we're like, oh look at look at that. That's uh, when I turned to Tess and I went, I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> um, Tess is also not swayed by the charms of Oscar Isaac, like some of us might be. Look, I appreciate his acting. It's a purely it's a sexual preference. Like Can you I'm check just her not pulse, right. Now? Oh my god. I know. I You're know. not sexually attracted to young Al Pacino? He's just not my. Well, I didn't say that specifically. I said that's <laughs> There's just something, I guess, because I know everyone else feels that way. I'm like, well, let them have him. But I appreciate his acting, although I he didn't do much in Annihilation. It was, which was great. It was a female dominated sci fi movie, which is fantastic. Everybody was really excited before the movie came out because he was only billed as being the husband in the IMDb, and everybody was like, yes, (laughs) Oscar Isaac is the husband. Um, yeah, it was weird how much... Um, I mean, first of all, I'm glad Tess and I both saw it because there's no way you could possibly explain this movie no. in the amount of time we have on a podcast uh, mm-hmm. to each other and also to the audience. So we should probably decide how, what level of spoiler we want to go with it because I actually... I mean, my favorite aspect of it is the end and that's the part that I could talk about the most. Well, let's we'll, we'll get there. So Annihilation is a sci-fi uh, movie about a team of scientists going to a area you're not a, supposed to go to some sort of contaminated area it's called area x i feel like the distinction is sort of weird in the movie in the book it's all called area x they also call it the shimmer in the movie but they also refer to area x as like maybe a region that contains the shimmer it's very strange mm-hmm. it's like a weird southern swamp 
Yeah, area. it's it's supposed yeah. to be in Florida somewhere. It's based on a book by Jeff Vandermeer. There's three. There was a trilogy of books, and it's based on the first one. But it's very much meant to just be a self-contained movie. I think. Yeah, and it's different. It's very different from the book. Yes. Supposedly. Yes. Um, but there are some things that are the same. Tess and I both brought notes. We did. Great, um, great. Can't wait. I uh, It made me want to go home and watch uh, Tarkovsky's Stalker, which I did. Oh, yeah. And then oh, yeah. my friend gave me a hard time about watching Stalker on a laptop. And oh, I was my like, God. <laughs> I was like, but I was really close to the screen. So, like, <laughs> there's a lot going on. You have a projector at home. Yeah, but I was like, like by m- I was watching it by myself. Like, Too much work. You know, I was, <laughs> it was great. It was super enjoyable for me. Um, and then I was reading about Soviet sci-fi all night long. Yeah, man. Um, which is the best. Well, Stalker is the only movie that Alex Garland, the director, has owned up to being inspired by because he, I think, like, I think understandably bristles at, like, the thing of, like, what things were you looking for for your movie? Because I think especially people who are trying to do, like, newish sci-fi, you want to feel like you're trying to, like... Yeah, it's a, it's a tribute slash ripoff of Stalker. Yeah. But that's the one thing he was like, yeah, Tarkovsky, definitely. It's a trip off. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and also uh, Solaris, which is the other Tarkovsky yeah. movie. Which I saw um, recently. I saw like a beautiful new. Like, oh, it's so good. Yeah. So Stalker, funny. there's also like a new Criterion print of it that's yeah. fucking mm-hmm. awesome. Um, but uh, Solaris, which is based on a novel by the Polish writer Lem Stanislaw, uh, is sort of invented the sci-fi concept of like the aliens being like instead of being little gray men or tall grays or little green men they it's like a planet mm-hmm. or like a gas it's like a consciousness it's like a consciousness and you like can't communicate with it at yeah. all it because just watches it's you. so foreign yeah. yeah um the solaris is a planet that watches you <laughs> it's a state of mind yeah. so yeah tess and i both really like a lot of the ideas that are in Annihilation. Um, I just felt like the characterization and dialogue was like, fell really flat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that it was, it's hard because you kind of place all your hopes on, when you see five women who are scientists, or I mean, I guess one is an EMT, but I mean, they're, they're five strong women who are not like being shepherded by a man or being sent on this mission by a man. In fact, like, you know, Ventress, Dr. Ventress, uh, who's Jennifer Jason Lee, she's kind of portrayed like you would, it's a shame that you would normally see men playing these roles, but I felt as though they could have intellectualized them more. And I was telling Molly that, um, it made me really nostalgic for the original Jurassic Park and Ian Malcolm, because I remember reading the book and seeing the movie, the explanation of the science and his, you know, drive to kind of wrap his mind around it was a lot of screen time was devoted to him kind of unpacking it. And I felt as though that was something that was kind of neglected. And I don't know if it is in the book as well, but we're just supposed to accept that, okay, so DNA is refracted like through a prism. And it's like, but what does that mean? And then you see that it can, you know, you can kind of transfer your DNA via touch that you become contaminated. Your DNA is seeping out all over the place and mingling with plants and becoming a fungus. And I thought it was interesting, but it seemed like, not satisfying to not have at least one of these very accomplished scientists trying to to give a more thorough explanation like it felt like a blind spot that we were just expected to accept and that it bothered me well the only the only one of them who is a scientist who would be Equipped to explain it is Natalie Portman's character, who's a biologist. The other ones are. No, there's a physicist. Oh, the physicist. physicist. Yeah, yeah. Tessa Thompson. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, then there's also a psychologist who, or I don't know if she's a psychologist or psychiatrist, but I also mean, psychologist. Phys- yeah. Spoiler alert. It's weird that um, the physicist gets the biology death. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yes. And Tessa and I were also bothered that Tessa Thompson's character, who turns into a plant. Spoilers. Spoiler. They don't show you that she turned into a plant. No money she shot. She kind of wanders yeah. off then you never see her again and it's very creepy and wicker man-y but you're also just like waiting for like the shot the of money her shot. as a plant yeah. and yeah. they don't show it and then, <clears throat> I don't know well, really we wanted to see it also made me want her to play poison ivy yes well uh, so so the thing about the book is that they actually have more character fleshing out in the movie than they do in the book they're pretty much like ciphers 
We saw it with a friend who had read the book, and he was like, there are even more, like, ciphers in the they book. They don't have yeah. names in the book. They're just called, well, they're different positions, too. They have, like, the surveyor, the anthropologist, the linguist uh, is one of them. There's no linguist in this one, um, which is because the whole thing that the linguist is interested in is not uh, in the movie, which is one of one of the bigger things that I, I miss from the movie that's in the book. But, um but I I kind of bristle against this idea, and this has come up multiple times, and I feel like I haven't had, like, a forum to talk about it um, or, like, haven't had the time or uh, I don't I don't know. But, like, I kind of bristle against this idea of, like, this should be a movie about strong female scientists. I don't think that that's what this movie is it's about. It's not the movie's fault no, either. But it's, it's it's fun to watch. It's fun to think about the portrayal of five female scientists well, or what's, five, you what's know. What's also yeah. funny is like I when I was watching it I like never thought about the fact that they were all women cuz right. just like regular people. Right. <laughs> and they're just like we're going to try something different. The last few expeditions have been men and we haven't done it with all women yet. So we're just going to see how it goes. And it's like cool. But then there was a point where they all came out in the suits and I was like, "Oh no, they're ghostbusters." Yeah. Um you know, because it's not <laughs> their fault or it's not this movie's fault. It just it stresses me out because I'm like, if this yeah. movie fails exactly. or if like a wrinkle in time, you know, fails, like, are we gonna, ever going to get any more female sci-fi ever again? Or are people going to be like, female sci-fi doesn't sell. Let's never sell it. I mean, like last, you know, like Annihilate or not Annihilation, Arrival was my favorite movie of that year. Um that was like a, a very successful movie and got nominated for awards and stuff and is very much told. That's like a developed, I feel like, scientist character dealing with something uncanny, an alien. If you want something that has like, that's a little more of a character study as opposed to this, which I feel is much more like it's like it is like those Tarkovsky movies where you don't I don't think you have a gripe about those movies that you wish the, like the main dude character that you knew more about him as like. A professional you, you do kind know of know more about him about <laughs> <laughs> i mean no but i mean like in the mold of a movie like aliens or predator which was one of the things i mainly was thinking about yeah, it's alien, like sure. mm -hmm. how much do you need to develop those characters that you know are all going to get killed off well i mean i think that i'm guessing emily that you would agree that the um crosby stills and nash flashbacks to <laughs> that the, made mm -hmm. Tess so mad the <laughs> helplessly hoping was really rough i mean that was a like but you know why like, it was used though to right no, tell me. Oh, come on. There are four people, or no, there are two people. They are three together. They are four. It's about cell division. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, I'll buy it. I, I can't watch a woman crying on a sofa while it's against my religion. Wow. Song plays. See, I won't do it again. I was brought up uh, CSN. C wait, how can I even pronounce this? Like CSNY. CSN and sometimes why? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to say, you know, the best parts of this movie reminded me of, of Angel's Egg a little bit. And sometimes I was like, I kind of wish this were just an anime, and I wouldn't. Be I so wish concerned. it was just an anime. <laughs> honestly, I mean, I, I think yeah. some of the design of it is cool, but I didn't 100% cool. love the aesthetic. No, I mean, I feel the same way, and there was a moment where I had like a false revelation that uh, turned out to not be true, where when they find, when, you know, the whole end is very cool. It turns into like a Jodorowsky movie in a way that is like made it worth seeing mm -hmm. for me, definitely. Um, and when she's in the like, there's like the bone fungus all Should over. Should we say that we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're in, we haven't really even spoilers talked about the ahoy. plot that much, but yeah. Yeah. we should probably spoilers warn that we're ahoy. going into she goes, spoiler territory. So. <laughs> she goes in a hole in a like a lighthouse uh, with like bone, a bone fungus, a skeleton fungus that's growing everywhere. That's very scary. And then she gets in there and it's like an HR Geiger uh, drain pipe. And then uh, she finds Jennifer Jason Lee or like an alien Jennifer Jason Lee. She's le Jennifer Jason Lee is letting the alien presence basically take over her body or like use and her body. And then Jennifer the Jason Lee goes, Annihilation! <laughs> <laughs> Mortal Kombat! I mean, it's sort of funny because annihilation is also like a, a, a significant word uttered by that character in the book. But it's, No, I it's, read. It makes a lot more sense in the book. Yeah. But it's one of those things like in The Shining where it's like a vestige of the book that like is creepier because you don't have the context for yeah. it. Like in The Shining right, right, with right. the bear, the bear costume guy. Oh, and speaking of bears, that was, I think, the best part of oh, Annihilation. Oh, yeah. Tess liked the bear a yeah, lot. Yeah, I loved the bear. <laughs> I feel like it's I feel like it's a good litmus test I, like to know what's scarier to you the the green suit at the end or the bear because I think that everybody I've talked to who's seen this movie it's one thing or the other like one thing 
upsets them more. Um, okay. Well, okay. So she, so Jennifer Jason Lee goes annihilation, and then she turns into like prismatic rainbow matter. And then what I thought that meant was I thought, oh, you become the shimmer. Like, yeah. the, the shimmer is people. Yeah. Um, and then it was like, no, it's an alien. Well, I mean, I, but I think that's how the alien manifests itself, right? I guess. But then it's like, and then someone comes out in a fetish suit and does like a tango. The dance, the modern dance. I mean, look, oh my it, was, God, you it guys. was good, but it was bad. You know, I mean, that's kind of it like. Was, it was good, but it was bad. Okay. We watched it with our friend Brendan Whalen, who used to do the social media for um, a fetish wear site. And he was like, it's just a zenny suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, I'm willing to I'm willing to fill in a more more of that scene for you if you're open minded about it. I don't I don't suppose that you've written anything that I've written about it on the internet, so I, I'll be happy to repeat myself here. We read your we read vulture your article, review. both of us, yeah, and I'm- we <laughs> both test test was like this isn't a drug movie. I did not think it was a drug. Well, it was eleven twenty in the morning, but you know, I went in with an open mind. And I still didn't feel like it was a drug movie. I don't think it's a drug movie. I'm 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 in a drug movie. Well, that was in my first piece that I wrote about it. But like, I I don't think it's a drug movie in that it is about drugs. But I think it's like maybe destined to be the kind of thing that you show somebody at a dorm room at four in the morning, like that kind of movie. Yeah, but you know what? Like then I went home and watched Stalker, and I was like, you know, Stalker is like a more psychedelic movie, even though there is no rainbow fungus in it. It's like the it's paced better. It is scarier. Just like this was fine. It was okay. But you know, when I realized it was Alex Garland, I also really liked Ex Machina, which mm-hmm. Tess, I think, did not like. No, it's, again, with the interpreter <laughs> dance, <laughs> which is oh. the same actor, oh, yeah. I believe. Oscar yeah. Isaac and interpretive dance. Yeah, There's I know. two checks on your list. But you know, I did, I did really like Ex Machina. Um, I I don't know why I was underwhelmed. Maybe because you built it up and I thought it was going to be great. Well, I didn't build it up. Because I would say that I gave, I would give this, if, if I had to do a star rating, which I never do for movies, but like, it would be like a three and a half out of five for me or something. I don't think that it's perfect at all. I think most of the like body of the movie is kind of poorly written. Um, not because of character development, but just because it's just sort of like laying out all these sort of structure and stakes things that feel much more like, like skeletal Hollywood structure than the, than the, uh, then I think the movie really is trying to do. And I feel like that kind of undersells how kind of cosmic it goes at the end. Can I, um, can I recommend a, something that I read about Annihilation that I thought was a really good take on it? Um, it, it appeared in Collider and it's by Matt Goldberg. And he basically is like, this is a movie about cancer. And it well, yeah. obviously cancer's a through line, but the way that a cancer spreads and changes and it doesn't have like an agenda other than the, you know, innate biological agenda to self-destruct, which is also referenced a lot. Um, but how how it like mutates and changes and then he also kind of went into like, oh, they're all women. The most common form of cancer is breast cancer. Like it was an interesting thought to to play with more. It starts with them looking at cervical cancer cells at the beginning. Like I think that's very intentional. I mean, I think, you know, I think that this movie is also like resonating more for people who have like, <laughs> uh, have, you know, dealt with depression or any other kind of self destructive tendencies. Cause I think that th- there are people who watch that ending scene and are like, it's, yeah, it's like out there. It's crazy. And then there are people who are like, oh my God, like, I, yeah. I mean, I had like an extremely emotional reaction to the end. Uh, I appreciated that it like was trying something crazy yeah but i do think that alex garland has sort of like an endings problem um other than ex machina which i really like the ending (laughs) of um but you know i I remembered he wrote sunshine also which is a movie that i really really liked up until a certain point and i was always like it's like 2001 is like the acid cosmic horror movie and then this is like the ecstasy movie right um in sunshine also it ends with like and then there's a guy a scary guy (laughs) yeah like and i think for me just having it be like like a scary, like a like a boss, you know, a level boss instead of just being sort of like, oh, it's a mind fungus and it's not right. like a human being. The fact that it was like, if it had been, like Tess and I were saying too, if the body had been like made of slime, we would have been much more into it. Yeah, we wanted more slime. Um, I mean, I guess we thought we were looking for slime because we were yeah. like, maybe Emily is like, maybe it's because slime. Because oh. Tess was like, why did Emily want us to see that so badly? I don't understand. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, the part where like the the guys, the guy, the the suit thing is kind of like grinding on her and yeah. trying to become her. Like I hundred percent thought it was gonna be like oh it t- percent. I think I just said <laughs> it tur- it turns into slime and like takes her. You know, but again, maybe that's oh. just because I was I was thinking for blob horror. See, I find it well. I mean, you know, you you see that part with the like deers who are marrying each other. Basically, I think that there's something terribly unsettling, much more than a bunch of slime would be, about these sort of autopilot cells that are just mimicking the body that are you like the idea of being in something that feels like a fight but is not a fight because it's just you is like I feel like a kind of constricting fear around my (laughs) chest because that sounds like a nightmare like that sounds horrible well, I initially, when watching it, I was like, oh, it's about PTSD because they both served in the, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was yeah. scary when yeah. it had no face. That was the scariest part. There oh, were some yeah. very scary images in this movie, including the moving gut. There were like a lot of things yeah. I really liked and I appreciated how ambitious it was. Yes. Um, I think I also just felt like, oh, I don't want to have to put the pressure on this movie of mm-hmm. like, will we ever get another like team of female scientists? That's movie? what I meant when I said that it was, you, you you want so badly for it to yeah. be perfect. And I think what you expect from it yeah. depends a lot on what you, the changes that you want to see in the roles that women get to play. We and were so- talking about another movie earlier. I don't want to out test, but I'm going to, as she said, she wasn't a fan of Lady Bird so much well, as look, everyone else was. But she said also, she was like, but guys get to make like narcissistic movies about their lives all the time that like maybe aren't the greatest movie in the world so like i don't want to condemn it because you know i liked lady bird but it didn't blow me away as much as i wanted it to and then i had to and then you felt guilty for not loving it because you were like i want it to be like my favorite and i thought the performances were incredible and i was happy that it was there but i think maybe it's expectations that that i have that are so unrealistic uh to be met of like i want lady bird to be the best movie. Right. You Whereas know? we bring nothing to go see Paddington 2 and then I like love Paddington exactly. 2 because yeah. I have nothing yeah. riding on Paddington 2, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I, I feel like having that attitude, especially about anything like created by or featuring women is like, I don't know, a recipe for... <laughs> it is self-destructive. <laughs> and, 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 and it's unfair also, like, yeah, because exactly, you don't, you don't come in with that expectation about... No, it's totally unfair. And I also, like, I feel like I put this pressure on Natalie Portman all the time, too, yeah. you know, where I'm like... Oh, oh see, like- that's where I differ, because I'm like, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I guess I understand in a cynical way why they wanted Natalie Portman to be this character. It's not like she's not the character, but I don't think that... That, like trying to sell the movie on her name alone is any kind of strategy because I feel like people are much more excited right now in general to see Tessa Thompson and Gina Rodriguez in a movie. Well, that too. I mean, they were like, you know, I think it's also just because she's playing this main character who's a little more of a Mary Sue and a little more a sort yeah. of like a cipher. And then there was like the part that Tess and I both were like, this is the best part was <laughs> when uh, Gina Rodriguez was like, oh, we got hella footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That you was know? the best. Because I was like, she probably ad-libbed that because I don't know that Alex Garland has ever heard hella but it just felt like, you know, it was like, oh, a real person, like a, a character who feels like they have a life that exists before they were yeah. in this. Well, I, mean, I think one of the things that I really wanted to was I wanted it to be a much stranger movie than I yeah. felt like it was. I wanted it, like, I was just thinking when we were talking about, you know, these expectations. That, that ending was on. too normal for you? <laughs> it wasn't that it was, it was that there was so much formulaic plot right. in, in that yeah. movie. I mean, yeah, I didn't need any of the backstory or the no, setup. I didn't like, either. I just, like, yeah. I could have just been, I, they could have just started in Area X and just... And I found the I found the characters, I mean, it, it was not just the characters themselves, but how, how the, like... The expositional ex- dialogue. The expositional dialogue. The way dialogue. they were, like, they were talking... She talk- cuts to feel. Yeah, she and cuts no, to I, I could not, that stuff not was to kill so herself, silly to me. but to feel. That's yeah. the thing, where I'm like, don't don't condescend to self-destructive exactly. women. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> like, self-destructive. That's, why I, yeah. that's why I'm like, I don't, I would rather do away that with that entirely. I would rather have those performances from the supporting characters be purely performance and not written as like, you know, she does X, Y, Z, therefore this, because that feels so on the nose and like, un, like so literal in the way that I don't think this film is operating in a really literal way. I mean, how are you supposed to really ex- like explain the ending in an A to B manner? It's just, it's kind of all at that point. Kind yeah. Of a, I wish this movie had had like 90% less dialogue yeah. and yes. just been a lot more like plants growing into animals totally. and becoming each other. Cause obviously I like that. Yeah. That was, 
That was great. I don't and know I'll, why, but Tess is looking up welcome to me on well, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not distracted. And I have no, but I, it's just because when we were talking oh, about the best movie about a self-destructive woman. Yes. And I think it's, it's interesting because I think every time there's a movie that is being framed as being like very strange or kind of mind bendy or something, I'm like, well, I don't know if I should recommend welcome to me. You're judging it against a welcome to me. Curve. Welcome to me was not well received. It, I mean, it was not well received, but it was well received yeah. by oh, me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like from when you talk about like a self-destructive person or a personality where you have that you know you kind of identify or you see parts of yourself in a very extreme characterization of of a person like welcome to me was it, it didn't rely on anything familiar but it painted a very specific and you know a, a, it was a very full portrait of a self-destructive person maybe not completely successful but i mean i wanted something where the characters like you you know i really have a hard time with the she wears long sleeves and she cuts herself to feel because i'm like that's just kind of it is it's condescending you and it's it out so of a much catalog less. almost like yeah. exactly yeah. tess has a lot of tropes that like she cannot deal with mm-hmm. which i respect and one of them is people uh using a stage brush like people b- sweeping sweeping in a the scene. floor <laughs> it's sweeping the floor that was my main issue with horace and pete <laughs> which they don't ever really do a lot of on cheers surprisingly no they yeah. don't no it's wiping the bar and i don't have no Ooh. problem with wiping the bar <laughs> the bar bar got be wiped but the floors when when you see someone sweeping a floor and you look at the floor and you realize that there's nothing there and there's no pile and there's nothing to sweep it's, it takes me out of it um more yeah, dust so we're pro, but i we're pro cosmic horror yeah 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 i mean i i agree that it should have just been weirder if that's the main like complaint because i think that i mean the, the, in the for the same reason i'm saying that i kind of resist this wanting to read it as like this victory because it's about five strong women i'm like well women should also have stories about like like cosmic dissolution too because like that that is like and usually that is just a like men get to experience that in movies and i feel like people are afraid to put women through that kind of thing fully in a movie because it feels like oh it, they're weak and we need to always show strong women uh in movies and i feel like in something like this it's so much more yeah and i enjoyed it more certainly than i enjoyed seeing jennifer lawrence get the shit beat out of her and mother oh my god know? like there there are things about that movie that i liked but i also you know could have done with more zenny suit dancing <laughs> wait till you see jennifer lawrence get the sheet sh- the shit beat out of the sheep for the shit beat out of her and uh red sparrow do you think she has brendan fraser uh itis where she like wants to get beaten up in movies as like a self-destructive tendency it's very possible Maybe. it's very possible well i mean we should all actresses it's like yeah you're a little bit of masochist all cause. actors too. <laughs> let's be honest guys let's take another night call let's do a night call so we have another night call night email i guess if you will uh that also happens to double as a fraser minute uh tess you want to read it for us sure so this comes from kate and she writes dear night call I actually already left you two voice messages about two different things, but this also just occurred to me. I was too embarrassed to call back a third time. I'm so grateful that you all provide regular Fraser banter. So my question is, have you ever tried to cast the role of Maris? The first person that comes to mind for me is Parker Posey, but that's never felt quite right. Despite the entire point of Maris being that she is vividly described but never seen, I can't quite seem to picture her. Is it possible? Is it like trying to imagine the face of God? Thoughts? Great question. Yeah. That was a good one, Kate. Thank you. That's such a tough (laughs) question because it is like trying to imagine the face of God, right? I almost don't want to – like I understand why Parker Posey, especially because of her and Best in Show. Um, But I feel like Maris is almost like transparent – like I always imagine her as being like a frail ghost. I have maybe an answer. Okay. Um, so as everyone knows, I've been watching all the Cheers in the world, mm-hmm. um, and I realized from watching Fraser prequel Cheers that the device, the Maris device of the off-screen character, is actually from Cheers um, mm. in reference to Norm's wife, Vera. Oh, right, right, seen, right, right, right. Um, but it's talked about a lot. Um, I also have realized that everything I've ever liked about any sitcom is from Cheers. <laughs> 
everything I liked about Friends was actually stolen from Cheers. Why did it take you so long to watch Cheers? It's so strange. I, yeah, I, I kind of can't drink, believe you never watched it So I was it always like, why would I want to? I don't like hanging out in bars in real life. But didn't your parents watch Cheers? No, I didn't watch sitcoms until the 90s. There's like a like a blank period where I didn't know anything about culture. And the just, artist devoid of sitcoms. <laughs> I watched Sesame Street and read nerd books. And then I insisted on watching Full House. Cheers was the first show that I remember watching alongside my mom and not understanding, but like laughing along with the laugh track to prove that I got it. So, I mean, I don't, I didn't remember much about the, that initial viewing, but I remember like all the characters and the vibe and everything. But yeah. Yeah. My parents watched Twin Peaks. Oh. <laughs> but wait, so who would you cast as Mary? Oh, so I was watching Cheers and there's an episode where I'm in the Rebecca years now, mm. which are, you know, it's a different show, but it's fine. <laughs> Um, Rebecca's sister came on and she was played by Marsha Cross. Ooh, I know. I remember this. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. As her like slutty sister who always steals her men. Um, and Sam tries to set them up into a, you know, he tries to play them off each other. Um, and I thought Marsha Cross would be a great Maris, actually. That's a su- she's it's got a really that, good call. she's see-through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's very, very skinny and sort of patrician looking and, and scary. Yeah. But I do also <laughs> think you can't really, I, I think Maris is the, the person, uh, thing from the end of Annihilation. You should <laughs> totally. cast, I feel like it would be interesting to cast against type. Uh, I think for Maris. I think my Maris pick, the person whose face usually comes into my mind is Jane Adams, weirdly. Oh, um, that makes mm-hmm. sense too, because she appears on Fraser later as someone else. Oh, and nice. she's just got these big. Yeah, she is on Fraser. That's right. Um, she, yeah, she's, she's got too, these big um, eyes. And... Am I allowed to say too ethnic? Mm-hmm. She's like too. <laughs> <laughs> she's not like waspy enough, is my um, feeling. Because um, I feel like uh, she looks too like. Um, like a real person. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say Mercedes McCambridge, but that's like a big time hop. Who's that? <laughs> Mercedes McCambridge. Wasn't she? <laughs> Orson Welles called her the world's greatest living actress. I'm relying heavily on my phone this podcast. But So she was the voice of the demon in The Exorcist. Okay. All right. But also, also I, wasn't, she, wasn't she Annie Hall's grandmother? Grammy oh, Hall. Grammy Hall. Comes Am I up making a lot. that up? I'm gonna look. I like the I idea know. that Niles is that Maris is actually like very old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying I would time hop. But I mean, also, like, I know I have. I'm a hundred percent would believe that that Maris would not necessarily be like either because she's like. You know, she's like uh she's like our uh, our World War theorist. Like she might not be the most eligible. Yeah. Debutante. Couldn't, couldn't you see? And Niles is totally her her beard that she marries. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But also, like, couldn't you see Niles in like a Harold and Maude situation? Yes. And then it's just like oh, yeah. twenty 100%. years later, and they're still together. Yeah. Um. Well, that was a great question. Um. Let's take it to uh, speaking of uh, self destructive, uh, sadistic <laughs> tortures. <laughs> mm. Um. I made Tess and Emily watch. Uh, Darren Brown, The Push, which is a Netflix special from the magician Darren Brown, who is a mentalist and uh, a famous person in England, but not here. And I feel like this was his first attempt to cross over into America. And what an attempt it and was. And what an attempt. Can I say that the title, Darren Brown, The Push, sounds like a sex toy? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Darren Brown, The Push is a reality TV special that is best described as like a serious Nathan for you. Deathly. Where you try to socially condition someone to agree to push someone off a roof at the end of like a long night in which you've gotten them to agree to do all these different other demeaning things uh, leading up to uh, getting them to murder somebody. Guys, nope. what'd you think? Nobody <laughs> was actually murdered, but that it doesn't mean that it didn't feel like somebody was. Yes. I guess. I'm so mad at you for making me watch this, Molly. <laughs> I was, I mean. That's because I'm the Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah. I was like, Welcome. Annihilation. To- um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was, uh, I did not watch this all the way through. I will admit, first of all, I, I, I watched a, lar- a lot of it. I watched over half well, of it. Well, then you missed the ending. I, I, I did. have to cop to the exact same. I could not. Yeah. I did tried. you look up to see what happened? Yeah, no, I, I, looked up, I looked up to see what happened. And okay, guys, he didn't do it. Yeah, he tried to get somebody else to do it. No, he just didn't do it. He, he just said, like, no, this is wrong. I won't do it. 
and then they cut to the three other people they did it on and they all do it <laughs> uh, shaking my head no it's amazing it's like reverse edited because you're like this guy's totally gonna do it and they lead all the way up to it and then at the end they're like you have to do it you have to push him off the roof and he's like no i'm not going to this is fucked up i don't believe in like i don't want to do it i don't care like it's not worth it to me i'm leaving and you're like, oh, and then they're like, oh, but also we ran this experiment three other times. And then they just show you one after the other, the people being like, oh, no, oh, God, oh, and they just push them. <laughs> they like cover I, their mouths. And- so I, I feel like we can get to a deeper. Co- I want to maybe not discuss this right away about the veracity of all of this. But I feel like those three other contestants could have easily been not real like maybe chris well, the, whole thing the guy could be here not real. no i know that's what i'm saying like i mean before we get into that whole aspect of it about if it's even well, it's real. like the tv show cheaters it's right like, yeah. yeah exactly it's a thought experiment and the way it makes you feel like the fact that you guys both reacted like so violently it worked we got it. pushed you got <laughs> pushed <laughs> i actually found the the they do have they have kind of a button at the beginning that is a different social it's like a microcosm of the whole thing of um a man receiving a call at a cafe and the man is not an actor but everyone around him is an actor and um darren brown and his friend or co-worker i don't think they're friends who knows (laughs) the other guy he's with they call this this person in the cafe and they instruct him to steal a baby carriage because they say you know that baby's been kidnapped and we're the police you need to get out bring the baby out of the cafe so the guy does exactly what they say and he brings the stroller outside the cafe going like this is crazy i don't feel right about this but he's doing it anyway and i was so immediately disturbed because there's a truman show aspect to it of Mm -hmm. you eliminate you know anyone nobody around this man is acting in good faith and so that's That's fascinating it's It's fascinating because in all because in the social okay so first of all these are all people who signed up for a reality show went through a barrage of like psychological tests to prove they could be on a reality show and then were told they didn't get the job and then the reality show starts so it's like david fincher's a game Yeah. yeah it's like it's, but yeah, it's a lot even like, though yeah. they audition for a reality show, if any of them at any point, and even though everyone around them is acting like an actor, <laughs> like acting very actory, which yeah. is also hard, like impossible to tell from British. Yeah, no, I thought everybody was such a bad actor. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that but they like, fell if anybody it. were like, "Am I in a reality show? Yeah. Like, is this all a setup, yeah. like constructed to get me to push someone off a roof to their death?" Like, then you'd sound crazy. The, the right. which is kind of the premise. recreated corpse is the best actor of anybody, and that thing. <laughs> was like that's low key the, the biggest yeah. achievement of the show is that oh, corpse true. which oh also tessa and i saw a preview to, before annihilation for s- the steven soderbergh movie unsane oh, oh my yeah. god we're so gonna and see that, unsane. Is, that is for sure a night call yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm supposed to, i think i'm gonna see it uh in a couple weeks so we should definitely talk about it um, so yeah darren brown um darren brown is like he's a mentalist and all of his magic is sort of about social conditioning and linguistic programming and how you can like convince people to do things if you talk to them in a certain way and if you like repeat words over and over again um, you can't see it right now i'm doing like, like a big jack off motion <laughs> <laughs> i can hear it he's super famous in england yeah. and he's also like a genius at close-up magic and like regular magic um um, but I mean, you know, the end of the show is he's like, don't be a fascist. Like, don't do stuff just because people tell you to. Because like, even though you think you're helping, you might not be. And like, listen to the voice in your head of like why you're doing things instead of just doing things because you think you should. But See, he he underwent. I mean, he the the manipulations and the lengths that he went to. It's hard because. If it weren't a reality yeah. show and it were an experiment, it would be very, very different. Okay. Yeah. Well, in what way does this like, mimic, mimic like what, at what point does this diverge from anything that resembles anything a normal human is going to go through well, in life? Like this. So I feel like if you signed up for one at this point, you would know that maybe you were going to get like mega pranked. You know, I don't think that like, means he probably that has like a shadow LLC or something. No, he well he did one. There's one about the apocalypse that's really amazing. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, that one's really fucked up because it's a kid whose family are like he's a layabout and like <laughs> we're all tired of his shit so they all conspire to like help do the con on him oh which God. is the scariest thing That's of all because so yeah. like, Mary's baby everyone you know is in on it and they're your family oh uh, my God. but they're like he all he does is like fucking fuck around on his computer so they start it's very black mirror they start like seeding his computer with fake news stories 
um, huh. and like his phone. And it's like the computers in their house all have these fake news stories that like lead up to a sort of 28 days later situation. But like nobody, you know, I hate everyone. That. In- Honestly. Hey, I mean, the, you the know, the question is, what does this do to the person, the subject of this show? Yeah. I mean, if you if you actually had to put yourself through, you know, coming to a place where you thought you were pushing a human off a building. I mean, look, they all volunteered I for a Darren that, Brown show. I don't think that. And they're no, all, and then Darren like Brown all. comes out at the, Darren I, Brown comes out at the end and they're all like so happy to see him. And they're just like, oh, God, I love you. Well, that's a social experiment that you're the you're a person who is, you know, pretending that you're illuminating these truths about humanity, but maybe you're just kind of stoking your own ego. Well, he's like a weird con man in, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know if he's a genius in like the Ricky J way, you know, he's definitely like a manipulator. I think the thing that I um that I find to be the most disingenuous about it is this like kind of underlying message that he's saying that it, that is going on about like don't be a conformist, like don't let yourself get wrapped up in in a right, fascist it's like, regime. Don't get in it, don't get in a crazy Truman show where but, everyone's but, lying but, to you. But it's it's I feel like there are so many of these like dog whistles in it that are actually way more appealing to like men's rights activists and stuff because it's all about here's a compliance mode. It all feels very pickup artisty and like I totally agree. how to manipulate okay. people to like get what you well, want maybe, how to be alpha and shit. And I like I no, for sure, so and gross. a lot of a lot of that Frank T J Mackey stuff. The real Frank T J Mackey, whose name I forget, mm-hmm. uh, but who once got mad at me for doing a blog post about mm-hmm. how his thing is literally to be like linguistic program people by getting them like you just say like below me. You say like, could you reach that? that soda below me and you just say it like over and over again and it's like you're programming them to want to blow you <laughs> who would ever say could but you reach that like soda a, below me so, dude what right, that's what I'm saying it's a dog with soda, sofa, but like, soda? <laughs> uh, guys this is a women's rights activist podcast yeah, exactly. we're WRA all the way over here WRA I have to say like it was a different time but I used to watch pickup artist and thought it was an interesting experience Experiment just I mean it was obviously horrible horrible and it made me feel rotten inside but I was like but this didn't is- you like mind hunter yeah I've been liking mind hunter okay so you like thinking about like the rotten parts of the human brain that For make sure. people do fucking crazy things but, is it just if it's real or fictionalized well this is the thing is it felt you know my mixed feelings about the bachelor for instance of how you kind of you know take these people you put them on a show you you, you create very strange circumstances that they are forced to adapt to they have real emotional responses to things that are constructed there's like an ambivalence there but then when you take someone it, it's essentially emotional torture to prove a point. And I don't think that the point was necessarily proven. And I also think that, you know, it it made me very nostalgic for, I shouldn't be nostalgic for it because it's ongoing, but Nathan, for you, where I would expect to feel that same kind of like, oh, I feel morally uncomfortable with this, but I don't because the motive is not to exploit or embarrass the or embarrass somebody. I know a lot of people who can't deal with that kind of comedy in general yeah. because mm-hmm. they're like too afraid they'd be the mark, you know? But they're it's not like, only that. It's so it's so hard to watch someone who is trying to do the right thing, but the whole frame is that it will be the wrong thing. Well, I thing. guess the point is that it's hard to do the right thing and people don't care if you do. So, like, in that situation, it's, like, everyone's telling you to push someone off a roof. Do you not do it? Because you're, like, no, I still know that's wrong. Yeah. I guess I just can't get past the actual stress of that he's going through. Like, I just, I think that that's a traumatic experience that they put him through. I don't feel like it's for any, like, particular, particularly enlightening outcome. I because I think, it's like. It's applicable to groups. It's just about group psychology and. and but I think it's stuff, like, it's nothing I feel like that hasn't been, like, it's, it's like a big Milgram experiment, basically. Mm-hmm. It is, exactly. Yeah. That's what's interesting about him. Like, you can do a Milgram experiment on British television. I mean, I like. <laughs> Only on British television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they let Netflix. you do anything on British television. I thought that the one thing that was very thought provoking and, you know, occurs, like, pretty early in the push if you have any interest in seeing it but are ready to duck out is um when they're doing the auditions i guess that everyone will be told they fail but they didn't 
they have a bunch of actors and then they invite in some actual just real people who don't know what's going on and they ring a bell oh, I had and to every skip time this. the bell rings oh yeah <laughs> well I was like this is interesting every time the bell rings the actors stand and the people who don't know what's going on it takes them a while but eventually they just start mimicking the behaviors of the actors right well isn't that like annihilation too it's just like human beings are just animals man you just adapt We're just Pavlovian yeah. dogs man I mean I think that there are more interesting things that could have been done with this idea than punishing someone this as much as they did. I mean, it's it really, I think you have to be at such a distance from someone else's humanity yeah. to think that it's worth that yeah. cost to make the point. Yeah, you know? I, I, I don't think it's a victimless show, I guess is how I feel in the end. I feel like those people could be, like, especially the ones, if, if those people did indeed go through this entire thing and then opt to kill the guy at the end and then learn that about themselves, I feel like that is... That could really fuck somebody up for their entire life, and oh, maybe for sure. like so send them down a really bad path. In reality. Um, uh, you guys, I'm gonna make you guys watch uh, Haunted, the Haunted House documentary. Oh, I started it and oh, I was really liking it. I'll make you watch that for next week because part of what I think is in yeah, okay. it's it's also about. Can you all repeat this stuff. the name so everyone? It's called can... Haunted. I think. No, it's called Haunters. Oh, it's called Haunters. I keep yeah. calling it the wrong Haunters. name. It's called Haunters. Isn't that a Pokemon? It's a, it's uh. about people. <laughs> People who are really into haunted house stuff and who professionally work as haunters in haunts. Ooh, but again, it's awesome. also, oh, that. you have to watch it. But it also, you're also going to be mad at me. It's going to be great. Oh, no. <laughs> That's different, though, because, I mean, that I watched that right after, I just started it right after the push. And I was like, see, these people want to be scared. That's what I'm saying. Those people want to be scared. Yeah. People who signed up for a Darren Brown show at this point, they know what they might be in for because it's like the fifth one of these and the last one was like the apocalypse and the one before that was like getting people to rob a bank. So like it escalates. I wonder what the next next one will be. I honestly want to see one where it's just like, will this person eat three cream pies? (laughs) How yummy will their meal be? (laughs) 50 Yorkshire puddings. Do we dare? Um. Do you dare watch something so twisted? Yeah. Guys, 50 Yorkshire puddings would also be torture. That's so much food. That's so much butter. It ties back to Phantom Thread, and here uh, we does. are. All, all about the Hungry Boys. Yep. A full British breakfast. So I guess you guys don't think Darren Brown's going to cross over into America, is what you're saying? Well, he we pronounces his, he overpronounces his name so hard that I feel like he's really trying to get a, his name into our minds. So maybe he um, will. He won the account. number one magician from the Magic Castle, like two years running. And I also, would love to see a mockumentary with someone else playing Darren Brown. And he's a, see what he's a linguistic programmer, <laughs> so he's just saying his name over and over Darren again. Darren so Brown. Like, <laughs> whatever it takes. That part where they keep saying whatever, whatever it takes. It takes. <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, um, this this was a lovely night call. Yeah, this was a wonderful night call. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And hey, if you like night call, we're a few episodes in now. I think you know what you're in for. Why not leave us a, a review on iTunes? Uh, give us a rating and a review, and 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 subscribe and subscribe Do if you all. aren't already. But you should be doing that by now, right? Um, and yeah, that that just helps us get the the show out in front of more people's eyeballs and s- helps spread the word. So yeah, and um, and and if, as always, leave us a night call too if you have any questions or anything to share with us at one two four zero four six night. And you can also leave us an email at nightcallpodcast at gmail dot com. And if you want to follow us elsewhere, come check us out at facebook.com forward slash nightcall podcast and on Instagram at Instagram account nightcall podcast and on Twitter at nightcall pod. We'll see you in the shimmer. Have a good night. <laughs>